without a rifle, a carpenter without a hammer. It's a Christian without a Bible study tool. And so tonight we're going to equip the soldiers of Christ with a tool. It's called Back to the Bible. Now, each, each uh, participant tonight should have a set of Back to the Bible in their Evangelism Simplified Workbook. If you don't have that, now is the time to raise your hand. If you cannot see the Back to the Bible booklet because of the print, if it's too small, raise your hand. We'll give you the large print edition. And we'll wa walk around and make sure that you have that. So tonight we're going to make sure that you're equipped with the, with the tools to do the job. And we're grateful for your presence tonight. Now, as part of our training, we're enrolling you into a school of to uh, equip you with the uh, needed um, materials and uh, the know-how to reach the lost. And that, that's called reaching the lost. It comes out every Wednesday morning. If you've not already signed up to receive uh, reaching the lost in your email every Wednesday morning, raise your hand. And uh, uh, we have a couple young men that will come by and pass you the clipboard. And you can put your name and email address and we will send that to you every Wednesday. You're going to get a report from all the churches enrolled, including this church. If you want to read about what's going on at Crossville, you're going to get it every Wednesday morning. And then you're going to also get a report from all the other churches. And then you're going to get a tool, an article, uh, something to help you reach the lost. And it's called Reaching the Lost. We are now in our third year of, of printing. Um, and it is, uh, comes out every single week. And I uh, hope that that will be something that you can add to your tool chest. So let me tell you a little bit about what happened last year. It was, uh, it was coming into the month of August. I looked at my wife. I said, Nicole, I said, I sure would like to do something for our anniversary. I said, we're going to be at St. Mary's, Georgia. I said, could we, uh, honey, do you, do you think we might uh, go deep sea fishing? And she looked at me. She said, for our anniversary. And I said, I've always wanted to go deep sea fishing. She said, sure. So I called over to the preacher at St. Mary's. I said, uh, if I wanted to go deep sea fishing, how, how would I do it? He said, I know the guy. He's good. He's the best in the bay. So I called him up and uh, the captain. And he said, sure. He said, I'll take you deep sea fishing. Haven't done, we haven't really done a lot of charters this year because of COVID. And um, I said, great. I said, what time should I be there? He said, three o'clock. I said, you must be pretty good. Doesn't give us a lot of daylight. He said, no, sir. That's three in the morning. I said, <laughs> I said, hey, not three in the morning. We're going to go. I said, sir, I said, uh, when I get there at three o'clock in the morning, how will I know it's you? He said, I'll be the only one there. <laughs> and uh, so we showed up. My family, my dad was with us. We showed up at the dock and it was the captain, the first mate. And, and he's got his, you know, his, his charter there and uh, just, just us. And we got in that boat and we took off. We're going out to the Atlantic. We're, we're going. He said, it's going to be a long while. He said, just kind of hunker down, go to sleep, and I'll let you know when we get there. So we slept for hours, you know, and finally we wake, he wakes us up. And he said, all right, it's time to, we got to catch our bait, you know. And, and uh, so he's, everybody get their poles in. And so he's got this little scanner, you know, it's kind of a, a, by the wheel. And he says, all right, I'm, I'm looking. Here it comes. It's counting five, four, three, two, one. And he said, pull him up. And we pulled him up and there were bait fish all over our line. It was incredible. I mean, he knew exactly where the fish were going to be. So we got the bait fish, put it in the live well. He says, all right, hunker down. We're going back. We're going out further. I wanted the big stuff, you know. So we go out there a little bit further, you know, about another hour. And he says, all right, who's up first? And I said, I'll go. And he says, let me, and he says, I got to, I got to, I got to put the harness on you. The harness? I said, what am I going to catch? He said, I don't know. So he puts the harness on me, he hooks me in, you know, we put the, we put the bait fish on him. We throw it out there and he says, all right, stand by. And he's looking at this little screen, you know, five, he had everything, four, three, two. He said, there it is. And man, that pole just went, boom, just went down like that. And uh, I think it was a kingfish that I caught. And uh, that kingfish, man, it was pulling. It was huge. And I was trying to get that. I was battling it. And he's giving me instruction. I was about to pull it into the boat. And a barracuda come by and took half of it. It was still as big as me. It was incredible. Brethren, by 2 o'clock that afternoon, we had our quota in fish. And we were going in. That man, that captain and first mate knew their trade. They knew exactly where their fish were. They knew exactly how to catch it. They had exactly the right equipment. They had the right training. They had put the time in to become very good at their trade. It wasn't an accident that they took me out there and knew exactly where the fish were going to be. It wasn't an accident by two o'clock. We'd all caught our limit. Brethren, they knew their trade. I believe tonight in this auditorium, 
we got men who are more qualified to catch catfish than they are to go fishing for men. Because we spent more time learning how to catch the trout, the catfish, and the bass. We spent more money on our jigs and lures and fishing poles. We spent more money in our tree stands and our infrared scanners and our maps and our, 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 our feed corn and our guns and ammunition and our, all the stuff that goes along with it. We got members of the Church of Christ that are more astute to go hunting for deer, fishing for fish, than we are to go out there and catch sinners. Brethren, that ought not to be. You know how you get good at something? You put your time and heart into it because you love it. It's your passion. You get home from work. You open up the internet. You watch the videos. You go to the Bass Pro or you go to the, you go to the academy and you buy your equipment. And you go out there. My son went out tonight. He's with some of his buddies over in Cookville and... Uh, and we're from the Willet area. And, you know, he's out there 25 degrees, you know, freezing. Why is he out there doing that? Because he loves it, right? Because that's, a, that's, something, that's, that's something he's passionate about. So if you're passionate about something, you'll suffer. You'll be uncomfortable, right? You'll put out the dollars and you'll get it. How many of you tonight have a, have a fish and tackle box somewhere in your house? It's your, it's your husband's or your brother's or your father's. Somewhere in your house, there's a tackle box. Anybody? Raise your hand. Anybody have a tackle box? You know why? You know why? You, that, you know what the tackle box does? It gives you the equipment to do the job. It gives you the fishing line. It gives you the fishing pole. It, it, it's got the jigs. It's got the, it's got the swivels and the hooks. It, it gives you what you need to catch the fish. Now tonight, I want to know in this auditorium, how many of us have the equipment to do the job? Where's your tackle box? What's in your tackle box, brethren? What, you, what, what kind of lure do you have to catch the person that doesn't believe in God? What kind of lure do you have to catch the person that doesn't, doesn't believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? What kind of lure do you have to, for a person that doesn't understand what they must do to be saved? What's in your tackle box? Here's what I'm finding out. Most members of the church don't have a tackle box. They don't have the equipment to do the job. Not only do they not have the equipment, brethren, they've not been trained how to use whatever equipment they have. They don't know how to use it. So what good is a good, you know, what good is a rifle if you don't know how to load it and aim and fire? What good is a fishing pole if you don't know how to put the bait on there and don't know where to go? So tonight, I want to commend you for being here. Because you took time out of your day after a long days of work because you want to go fishing for men. Brethren, we got to create a fire in the church of Christ, a passion for souls. And the local church has got to train their church members how to go fishing. We can no longer be keepers of the aquarium. We must be fishers of men. And until that happens, brethren, we won't grow. Tonight, we're going to equip you. You hold in your hand one of the most potent tools of evangelism that's ever been uh, written. And so Bobby Bates was an incredible soul winner. He and Jewel Miller and Ivan Stewart and, and a few other brethren during their time, they were the evangelists of the day. They went around the country training churches and teaching them how to do Bible studies. And so what we want to do tonight is continue that tradition. We want to make sure that members of the Lord's Church are equipped to study the Word of God. It's not advancing. Alan, can you help me? The PowerPoint's not advancing. We want to make sure that you have in your hand the tools to take it to the neighbor, the friend, the family member. Jesus said in John 4 and 35, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they are wide unto harvest. Brother, they're everywhere. You went to work with them today. I bet you said good morning. I bet, I bet it was something, uh, sometime today you spoke to them. So you have contacts. Now we got to learn how to do the Bible study. Remember, we're losing we're losing churches of Christ every single year. Brethren, every year the church of Christ is getting smaller. Every year the church buildings that are left, they're getting more sparsely populated. And so and if we don't address this, if we don't, I, I need men, listen, I need you to have more passion for going out there to save the lost than you have to get the big trophy buck. You think you can do that? You think you can have more passion to get out there. And, and I know you're going to be uncomfortable. I know it's, going, it's, it's not always going to be easy. But we've got to have that same drive tonight. We have a generation that's risen that doesn't know what a personal Bible study even looks like. But yet in our pews, we still have a million, a million member army. We still have got a million members in the churches of Christ. But they're un, untrained and ill-equipped. They do not know how to go into battle. 
We have preachers that don't know how to go into battle. We got elders that don't know how to go into battle. We got men that can stand and preach before crowds of 5,000. They can't have a Bible study with one person. You know how I know that? Because there was a time when I was that man. I was more comfortable getting into the pulpit and, and, it, and it didn't matter if I had 300, 500, 1,000. It didn't matter. But you put one sinner in front of me and, you know, I don't know what to do. That's a poor reflection upon gospel preachers. It's a poor reflection upon the kingdom when we're more comfortable with, with, with the brethren, with preaching to, 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 to the Sunday crowd than we are to take just one sinner and teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. That's our job. That's not the job of the Memphis School of Preaching. That's not the job of, a, of, of, of um, uh, uh, Brown Trail School of Preaching. It's not the job of Freight Hardmen. Brethren, this is the job of the Crossfield Church of Christ. This church has a responsibility to train their church members how to do Bible studies. We need more lessons in the church about how to reach the lost than how to traverse the storms of life. You know, you can go to a... You can go through a typical pulpit today and you'll hear a hundred sermons about how to get through the difficulties of life. But we're not training our church members how to reach the lost. This is paramount. This is important. We cannot farm this out. We cannot abrogate this, abrogate this to others. It's the local church's job to do this. I was talking to a good brother today and uh, his evangelistic family. And he said, Rob, I found, I, we've just moved into this area and I'm not going to tell you where it's at. He said, we found this church and we've been visiting. And he said, uh, I asked a question in the men's meeting. I said, brethren, um, when is the last time you had a conversion in this church? Is there anyone here that's been converted? There wasn't a soul. New converts are the lifeblood of your church. You don't have new converts. You have a dead church or it's dying. Brethren, you cannot survive without it. You will not be here if you don't have new converts. I was at a congregation of four or five hundred earlier this year. I'm, sit, I'm, I'm sitting with elders and I love elders. I, they're, my, they're my best friends. Uh, my, 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 my father served as an elder. My grandfather, I, I, t today, all the churches where I preach, those men, I love them. And I, I just looked at those elders and I said, brethren, how many new converts do we have in this church? None. By the way, they were 1,500 15 years ago. So how long will it be before our church is dwindles down? Because they're the lifeblood of the church. The Great Commission says, go ye therefore and teach New Zealand. And I'll tell you what, the hands go up and we're ready to go. Go ye therefore and go to Jamaica. And I'll have 50 people signed up within 10 days because they can't wait to go. Go ye therefore to India and we'll send them by the bus loads. Go ye therefore to South America, Latin American missions. Go ye therefore to America. And we're silent as a church mouse. Isn't it interesting that we'll spend how much money, how much time and how much energy going all over the world, when our next door neighbor doesn't even know Jesus Christ, when people in our own community don't even know we're children of God, when people we have known and worked with and, and grown up with don't even know the difference between us and them when it comes to our faith. Brethren, this is not the great commission, it's the great omission. We're not doing it here. If We do not take the gospel to this country. I believe... All the good work you've done in India, you're going to, have to call those preachers and say, come help us. Come help us. Because we're not here anymore. We, we want to take the gospel all over the world, but that, that also includes our own backyard. That includes Crossville. My name is Rick McCurdy. I preach for the Jamestown Church of Christ in Jamestown, New York. I recently heard Rob Whitaker's five lessons on becoming a soul winner. At each of Rob's lessons, I was overcome with sorrow. The sorrow was from the realization that although I, um, I know the Bible and I can present it and teach it competently to the brethren, I am woefully inadequate to teaching it to those outside the church. Time after time, Rob warned us about things we should not do, like um, chasing rabbits, uh, something we do to ease the doubts of the brethren, telling instead of showing, allowing an unbeliever to guide the study. I came to realize that while the school had prepared me to preach and teach the brethren, I had not learned to preach and teach to those outside. Thank God that's changing today. 
Over the last three years, we have a contract now with seven of our schools of preaching, and we're bringing this training right to our schools. And we're training these young men how to do Bible studies. And directors of schools have, have just confessed, and they said, Brother, this is an area we've got to do better. You can get them into the pulpit, but we've got to get them into our communities. We can get them into the pulpit, but we've got to get them into the homes of people, and we've got to teach our members how to do it. Because your preacher cannot do it all for you. He can't carry the load of evangelism on his back. You'll break him. He won't last. And so together, preachers, elders, and members, you can do it and you can be successful. I was in Florida earlier this, uh, this last year and I, I was at a good crowd. Uh, several hundred people were gathered together. Um, this congregation had well prepared the church for this seminar. I think there were about 10, 12 churches that had come together. It was, a, it was an exciting time. Sarasota, Florida is where we were located. And um, I had a good sampling of church members, and uh, many of them had uh, spent money, gotten hotels, and they were just, you know, parked out for the week. And I said, how many in the audience? I wanted a raise of hands. How many in the audience have a method to teach someone the gospel of Christ? You know how many people raise their hands? Ten. We had ten people in a crowd of hundreds that had a method to teach someone the gospel. Brother, how in the world... How in the world are we going to wage a war against sin? How in the world are we going to win souls for Christ? We don't even have a, a method to do it. Let me introduce to you this couple. We were, um, it was a Sunday morning. And um, typically we would be a little bit early. And I noticed uh, out the double doors, there's this family that walked in. He's about six foot two. He's got four children, his wife. And boy, that got my attention. And I walked up to him and said, my name's Rob. And he said, my name's Jonathan Royal. I said, nice to meet you, Jonathan. I said, he said, this is my wife, uh, Stephanie, and my children. Uh, and I said, well, this is my wife, Nicole. And I said, Jonathan, are you visiting in the community? He said, sure am. And man, my light bulb went on right there because that's what I'm looking for, you know. And uh, I said, Jonathan, I said, may I ask, are you uh, been invited, a friend of somebody here? He said, no. Nah. He said, um, well, I said, how'd you come to Willette? He says, I came because of you. He said, I said, huh? He said, well, somebody. He said, I had this publication uh, delivered to my door. Uh, you guys were knocking doors a couple months ago. It's got house to house, heart to heart. He had it with him. I said, well, that's great. I said, I'm so glad you're here. He says, uh, I said, well, I hope you feel welcome this morning. And so people were very friendly as they should be. They sat in the pew. We went through the Bible class, the worship service. Everything was going well. And after that, uh, after that uh, was over, I walked up and said, Jonathan, what did you think about this morning? He said, well, I loved it. He said, I enjoyed it. He said, I, I was able to follow along in my Bible. I said, that's great. I said, I tell you what, my wife and I just so happened to have this custom. I said, we like to have uh, visitors to our home for dinner. I said, could we, uh, could we have you come to our house for dinner? And I said, we get to know each other. He says, uh, I don't want to go to your house. I don't know who you are. And I thought for a second, I said, well, I've never had that happen before. And I said, well, what do you propose, Jonathan? He said, why don't you come to my house? So, so it's all right for me to go to his house, but he can't come to my house. Okay, all right, all right. Jonathan, that's fine. I said, when do you want me to come? He said, what about tomorrow, two o'clock? I said, I'll be there. So I looked at my family and I looked at my kids. I said, Jared, Hannah, go to the garage. I want you to grab everything that says ball, football, basketball, soccer ball, baseball, uh, tennis ball, whatever says ball, grab it. I said, you have one job. When I get to that house, I want those children out of that house and I don't want them to come in that house. I have one mission. Guess what it is? I'm going to do a Bible study. Nicole and I are going to walk in that house and we have one mission. In whatever else we have to, yes, we'll introduce ourselves. Yes, we'll talk about the weather. Yes, we might talk about, I don't know, Macon County. But we're going to get to that Bible study because talking about the weather isn't going to save their soul. You can talk to your neighbor all your life. It won't save their soul. You've got to do a Bible study. And so we walked into the house and uh, the kids did their job. They're out there playing football. And we're talking a little bit. And I said, Jonathan, Stephanie, you know a lot about the Church of Christ. Don't know a lot. I said, would you like to know more? Sure would. I just so happen to have these booklets. I'm always prepared. We bring out book number one. I said, honey, grab the Bibles and the pens. And we opened it up. And I said, well, let's look at John chapter 8, and verse 32. He said, now you just wait a minute, preacher. He said, I need to tell you a little bit more about me. I said, okay. He said, I am a former a deputy sheriff. And I said, I like deputy sheriffs. And he says, I'm from Florida. I like Floridians. He says, well, he says, uh, he said, my family was down there in Florida. And uh, he said, the drug problem got so bad, we decided we're moving out. 
He said, I came home and I said, we're moving. We're, we're leaving this state. I took early retirement today. And he got out the map. I love maps. And he said, I put the map on the table. And he said, I closed my eyes. And I said, wherever my finger lands, that's where we're moving. Boop, Red Bowling Springs, Tennessee. What are the odds? I said, John, did you know where you're at? I said, there is nothing in Red Bowling Springs. And he said, well, I said, what are you going to do out here? He says, I'm going to start a fencing company. Very successful company today. I said, all right. I said, sounds good to me. He said, by the way, we're religious. I said, well, I love religious people. He said, went to a big community church. I said, tell me about it. He said, man, he said, Rob, we got out there. And he said, uh, he said we had a charismatic preacher. He said, man, he'd fire him up, you know. He said, we, we, he filled the building. People coming from all over the place. It wasn't exciting. He said, my son was saved in that church. He just came down and forward and said to praise Jesus. And he said it was wonderful. And he said one day we got to the church and we noticed a preacher. He's gone. I said, where'd he go? No one knows. I said, oh boy. I said, okay, what happened next? He said, we just kept coming back and there were fewer and fewer people. One day we got to the church and it said, church closed. I said, really? I said he said, you're not closing anytime soon. Not that I know of. And he said, all right. He said, I just thought you should know that. I said, all right. John 8, 32. I said, let's look at John 8, 32. It's all about the word of God. I said, Jonathan, let's read that together. And ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. I said, Jonathan, uh, Jesus said that what will make you free? He said, how do you know it's Jesus? I said, oh boy, this is going to be a long one. And I said, well, <laughs> I said, if you go back to the next verse, Jonathan, it says, Jesus said, he said, by the way, he said, I don't trust anybody. He said, I just comes with the territory of 10 years serving on law enforcement. Everybody lies to me. He said, you will have to prove everything you teach me tonight. I said, that will not be a problem. I said, look at verse 31. Jesus said, he said, I got it. And he put it down. We started going through that study. The more we got into the Bible, the more confident he got. And he started to understand everything we teach comes right out of the word of God. And he, he loved it. We came back for study too. And they loved it. They didn't know the difference in the Old and New Testament. They didn't know anything about worship, Lord's Supper. I mean, they're, everything we teach them, they're just soaking it up. It's amazing that people can go to these big churches, right, for what, years? And don't even know the basics of, of, of the Lord's Supper and a prayer and, and the church. And, and, they're, and they're loving it. We come to the third study. And I can still remember what Stephanie said. She said, Rob... She said, we have never done that before. She said, I'm concerned. She said, Rob, we've never been baptized. I said, Stephanie, I know how we can fix that right now. And we did. We took, we took Jonathan and Stephanie right to the baptistry that night, baptized him in the Christ. And, and uh, as soon as he dried off, I looked at Jonathan. I said, Jonathan, I said, what about Johnny? He's 15 years old. I said, he doesn't know the truth. I said, we've got to teach him. John, Jonathan, when would you like to start to study? He said, I don't want you studying with my son. I said, excuse me? I said, John, I don't understand. I said, well, what's the problem? And he said, he said, you got any of those booklets? I said, you mean those back to the Bible booklets? He said, yeah. He said, I'd like to know. He said, I'd like to have some sets of those. He says, because we're going to study with our son. Brother, the question I have tonight is this. I want to know how we've been sitting in the pews for 20 years and we don't know enough to teach the gospel of Christ to a sinner. And I've got brand new Christians that are ready to do a Bible study. Brethren, we have no excuse. There's no reason why you can't do a Bible study. Back to the Bible is written on a fifth grade learning level. We've got middle school classes that are doing back to the Bible. And so if we have fifth graders that can do it, there's no reason why tonight you can't do it. And so there's no question tonight that you can handle this. That young man right next to me, his name Johnny Royal. You know where that picture was taken? South Haven Church of Christ, Power Lectures. You know what that little tag says on it? Memphis School of Preaching. He became a preacher. Today he's preaching at the Franklin Road Church of Christ in Flank, Franklin, Texas. Brethren, I, I want you to understand tonight that, that uh, all you need to do is to focus on one Bible study. Because if you'll just do one, guess how many Bible studies you'll produce? How many souls will be saved because of the one person you bring to Christ? We need to keep the expectations realistic. We're not asking you to convert Crossville. We're asking you to convert one person. 
We're asking you to look at a neighbor, friend, family member, co-worker, ball team member, somebody, and just do a Bible study. Now, let's talk about why we love Back to the Bible. Number one, it's simple. Uh, brethren, if it's not simple, this preacher isn't going to do it. Um, I, I'm not going to waste time. You know, I'm not going to sit there and have to do an academic uh, collegiate study to do a Bible study. Back to the Bible. The Bible was not written for that. Do you know when the Lord started the church, he chose fishermen? <laughs> he, he didn't go to Athens. He didn't go to the universities. He chose common people. You don't have to have a college degree. You don't have to know Greek and Hebrew to do a Bible study. In fact, probably help you if you didn't. If you just knew the Bible, you'd be better off. I don't have to do any unteaching that way. And so here we have a simple method. New converts are using it. Three studies, 90 minutes to complete. Yes, no, fill in the blank. No trick questions. No discussion questions. It's simple. It comes right out of the text. You read the verse. You read it, read it right in the, the booklet. And you put the, you put the answer there. It, you, can't, you can hardly mess it up. Number two, it's scriptural. Any Bible study that doesn't require you to use the Bible, run. Get rid of it. Throw it away. Because a Bible study ought to require the Scripture. It ought to require a person to open their Bible. This is the law of the Lord. This has the power to save souls. It's not about you. I don't need you to be eloquent. I don't need you to have the gift of gab. I don't need you to have a special personality type. I just need you to take people to the Bible and let God do the work. Now, the back to the Bible is based on the King James Version of the Scripture, but you can use any version of the Bible. Now, I'm not advocating for these modern speech versions that perverse the Scripture, but I'm just saying pick your battles wisely. When you meet somebody that is not where you want to begin the Bible study, when, when, when Brittany Massey brought in to our home the New American Catholic Bible and she laid it on the table, guess what we used? The New American Catholic Bible. We are not going to decide at that point to have a big discussion about manuscripts and what's accurate and what doesn't belong in the Bible. That is not going to bring her to the cross. That is a distraction. Defer, don't debate. Show, don't tell. Plant, don't pick. Hesitate. Hearken. Remember your seven principles. Don't violate them. You know, when Brittany Massey was uh, doing that study, we learned something about that Bible. She said, Rob, you see this Bible? I said, yeah, my, my grandmother gave this to me as she was dying. So if I'd have made fun of that Bible, guess what would have happened to that Bible study? It would have been over because she's not where I'm at. She does not understand what I understand. And there's no way in five minutes I can explain it. Guess what happened to Brittany Massey? She became a child of God. Guess what happened to that Bible? Went on a shelf as a keepsake. Because the Great Commission says to teach, baptize, and teach. There are some things that you teach later. And so all answers come from the text. It's yes, no, fill in the blank. But look at this. I want to share with you something that, that I, I just learned a few years ago. As we've become very close to, to Wilma and the Bates family. Um, of course, Bobby has been passed away for oh, about 20 years. And, uh, but his wife, Wilma, um, she has left that great legacy of faith. And uh, we've become very close to the family. In Acts chapter 8, I want you to notice something here. It's in verse number 4. Wilma actually taught us this at the kitchen table. How ironic, where most Bible studies take place. She said, Rob, uh, do you know how Bobby came up with Back to the Bible? I said, I don't, don't know, Wilma. She said, well, it's a scriptural way of doing it. And I said, well, you got to explain that. She said, well, take your Bible to Acts 8, 4. And therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ. When you preach the word, you got to preach Christ. When you preach Christ, you got to preach the word. You can't separate them. Now go down to verse 12. And when they believe Philip, who's Philip? He's an evangelist. He's an inspired evangelist. Guess what? He has an advantage that you and I don't have. He is inspired. I'm not. So whatever Philip did is going to be the best way to do it. I'm never going to come up with a better way to approach sinners than what Philip did. Now, how did Philip do it? Well, let's, let's read and learn. Verse 12. Then when they believe Philip's preaching, the things concerning, notice this, the kingdom of God, that's the church of Christ. Notice this, the name of Jesus Christ, that's his authority. Notice this, verse uh, number 3, verse 12, he baptized them. So when you're going to do a Bible study, I suggest that you, uh, 
ensure that the person knows about the authority of Christ, the church of Christ, and sin and salvation and baptism. Any Bible study that does not teach someone about the church of Christ, throw it away. I've heard these preachers today, our own brethren. Well, you don't need to talk about the church of Christ. You know, you don't, there's no need to study about the church of Christ. Friends, Jesus Christ died for the church. You cannot help a person become a Christian if you try to separate salvation from the church. This is where the blood is found. It's the body of Christ. And yes, we're going to talk about the kingdom of God. Yes, we're going to talk about the church that Christ purchased with his own blood. I'm not going to run away from the church of Christ. I'm going to run to her. Because that's where salvation is found. There is no salvation outside of the body of Christ. None. And so they have to understand the body. They got to understand how to get in the body. They have to understand how to access the blood of Christ. And that's why we're going to talk about baptism. Now, let's look at the third point. It is successful. And brethren, I know that tonight some of you are looking at that little booklet and saying it won't work for me. It, it's, it, I'm gonna, it's, it doesn't work. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I just cannot uh, buy into this. So I want you to listen to the brethren. Don't listen to me. Listen to the brethren. I want you to notice that uh, Sister Wilma Bates... I said, Sister Wilma, I said, uh, what is the success rate of Back to the Bible? How many people are converted that go through all three lessons? She says, 90%. She said, Bobby and I would baptize nine out of 10. So I've got my record book out. And I, I kept a record of all the Bible studies we've done. And I started counting it up. We had 92%. I, then, I, then I said, well, maybe I, I don't want to, someone to say, well, that's just you, preacher. So I just, then I started looking outside. I went to men like Shane Smith. He's just a, he's just an everyday deacon. He, he's a, he's Shane that works out in the field. He's got a little business and Shane's very, very successful in his business. And I, I trained the church at Bridgeport, Alabama. I said, uh, brethren, here's how you do a Bible study. Shane comes up and he says, Rob, I've never done a Bible study, but you'll be hearing from me. In three weeks, I did. He's not a preacher, didn't go to preaching school. This is uh, Cindy Rowland. Uh, this is Jonathan Royal's mother-in-law. Guess who taught her the gospel? Jonathan and Royal and his wife. This is John Howard. This is uh, Brian Howard's uh, father. He attended the uh, seminar we did down there in uh, uh, um, Valdosta, Georgia. Wes Hazel's the preacher. And, uh, and um, World Video Bible School had sent uh, Brian, who works for him, up to just uh, to, to talk about World Video Bible School. He came up to me after the seminar. Tears were flowing out of his eyes. And I said, uh, Brian, I said, I don't understand what's wrong. He said, Rob, I've, you know, I've never tried to do a Bible study with my dad. Not one time. He says, when I get home, I will do a Bible study with my dad. That picture was taken the night he baptized him. This is the Morganton Church of Christ, uh, Morganton, Georgia, 22 baptisms, 18 months. This is the Fayetteville Church of Christ, Fayetteville, Georgia, eight baptisms, six months. This is the Elizabeth Church of Christ. This is an interesting story. His name's John McGiffin. He calls me during the summer of COVID. And he says, Rob, they're in a Church of Christ open in Ohio that I can find. He says, we're going to start a church. I said, sounds good. He said, can you help me? We got about four or five members. He said, I need, we need to evangelize. It's the only way to grow. And I said, you're right. He said, they have 50 today. They just do Bible studies. This is the Suitland Road Church of Christ, Baltimore, Maryland, right in the, right in the city. Can you baptize them in the inner cities of Baltimore? Brethren, you can baptize them. This man baptizes people left and right. I'm going to get to meet Eric Sykes uh, next year. Eric called me uh, about a year and a half, two years ago. And he said, Rob, come up to Baltimore and train us how to evangelize. I said, uh, Eric, it'll be a couple years. He said, I can't wait two years to evangelize. I said, well, I'll send you my videos, all the materials you want. And man, Eric, is, he's hitting it. Every month, it seems like Eric's sending me another picture of someone who's been baptized. Here's the North Jefferson Church of Christ, a church that was, about, they were so discouraged when I, when I met them earlier this year. And um, the elders were discouraged, the preacher was about to quit. They've had 17 baptisms in eight, 10 months. 17. This is the Jacksonville Church of Christ. This is just this year. And brethren, I, I remind you that I'm on the road 170 to 80 days a year. But when I'm home, I want you to know what my family's doing. We're taking contacts from the local area and we're trying to prospect those contacts into Bible studies. We're taking those Bible studies to the baptistry. Those baptistry Bible studies become new converts and we're doing new convert studies and our church is growing. This is what happens when you teach the evangelism model and you get the members of the church busy. 
because you can grow. Evangelism works. And so for those of you who are sitting in the pew and say it doesn't work in this country, it's because you're not working it. You have allowed the great deceiver to convince you, go to India, go to South America, don't do it here. Stop listening to him. There are people in this town that need the gospel of Christ. And guess who the link is? Guess who they're waiting for? They're waiting for you. Have you ever mentioned him? Have you ever talked to your neighbor, your friends? I'm not talking about just a, you know, well, I invited him to the meeting. No, we've got to do Bible studies. That's what this is all about. That's where conversions take place. They're not going to be converted because you give them a track. I'm not opposed to tracks. I love tracks, Alan. But they're probably not going to be converted because of a track. You know where people are converted? When they study the book. You've got to get them in the book. This is the Oak Hill Church of Christ. How many of you were at Oak Hill? I bet several of you were at Oak Hill. 13 baptisms. That was since the end of July. So how do you use it? What do you do? We're going to talk about tonight in the few minutes I have remaining how to use back to the Bible. So if you have your back to the Bibles, get them out, please. Get a pen out. Open up your Evangelism Simplified Workbook. And I need a volunteer. I need someone to help me. Who, I wonder who that could be. Alan Judd. I can't believe it. Al, would you bring your Bible? You're going to need your Evangelism Simplified Guidebook. And um, you're going to sit right here in the front pew. We're going to convert Alan Judd tonight. And um, we're finally going to get him into the baptistry. And um, so tonight, I'm going to use Alan as a prospect. And so we've, uh, he's come and he's visited the church. And uh, so we've been prospecting Alan. We've been uh, sending cards, uh, giving him family, sending meals to his family. We mowed his lawn last week. He's been overwhelmed. Uh, he says, uh, I said, Alan, he says, uh, he said, man, Rob, I love this church. I, my family has never been uh, treated any finer. He says, Alan, do you know anything about the Church of Christ? No, don't know a lot. I said, I just so happen to have these little booklets right here. I said, why don't we look at this one, one right here. Now, in order to get a Bible study to be successful, there are a couple key things that you've got to know. All right. And so this is probably the most difficult part of the study. Is I've got to figure out where Alan's located without me giving him a, a quiz. And so I'm going to make a conversational transition. So we're going to make this very conversational and uh, this is the transition moment. So Alan and I are talking. I said, hey, Alan, I got a, I got a question for you. I said, you know, we've been talking a lot and spending some time together. And uh, you're a pretty friendly guy. And, and I suppose that, uh, I suppose that uh, you'd help me if I needed help, wouldn't you? Okay. And this is suppose, Alan, I was, uh, I don't know, I was living in uh, Dallas, Texas. And I called you and I said, Alan, I want to come see you. And I want to come spend a few days with you, maybe do a little hunting together. I said, Alan, uh, could you give me some directions from Dallas, Texas to Crossville? Do you think you could do that? He, probably so. And in fact, he might say, get on Interstate 30, pop over to Interstate 40, and you'll be there in, a, in about 10 hours. You know, he, kind of simple, isn't it? And then I said, now, Alan, let's just suppose. Now, let's just change the scenario. Let's just suppose I lived in New York City, New York City. And uh, I'm in New York, and I said, Alan, I live in New York City, and I want to come move my family down here to Crossville, Tennessee. Alan, would you give me instructions from New York City to Crossville, Tennessee? You know what he'd tell me? No, Rob, stay right there. You can't get there from New York. You cannot come to Tennessee. That's a joke, brethren. It's all right. All right. All right. He said, no, he said, come on in, Rob. Come on. He said, you get out there and interstate something. And, you know, he, he'd give me instruction. All right. Now, watch this. Alan, no one's ever got this wrong. Don't disappoint us. Okay. Alan, would you give me the same instruction from New York City as from Dallas, Texas to get to Crossville? Why? Two different places. I'm coming from two different places. He does not live where I live. Spiritually. And so you cannot expect the prospect to be where you're at. So i got to figure out where he's at. So in order to figure out where he's at, I'm going to ask a few questions. You can find them on page 111. I'm going to do it very conversationally. This is what I'm not going to do. Alan, i got this little test. I'm going to grade you. Would you take this test for me? And I'll let you know how you do. No. I'm not going to hand him anything. In fact, I'm going to do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, in fact, my, 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 my partner, my silent partner, Nicole, which is my favorite silent partner. She reads my mind most of the time. And, uh, I'm gonna, and she, Nicole might even write these down for me. So I'm going to say, Alan, uh, do you believe in God? I, I think you do. We've talked. I, I thought you did. And Alan, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? And Alan, uh, do you understand that Jesus uh, um, is part of the Godhead, like the God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit? Do you have any problems with that? 
Okay, you know, there might be somebody out there that does. And if they have a problem with, you know, believing in God and believing in Jesus Christ as a son of God, I'm not going to start with back to the Bible. When Bobby Bates wrote back to the Bible, nine out of ten people in our nation believed in these concepts. That's not any more, that's not any longer the case. There are some places in, in this country where you have an equal or higher percentage of people who don't believe in that. So back to the Bible is not going to be the study I use. But you live in Crossville, Tennessee. You know what that means? <laughs> Seven out of ten people out here still believe in the basics of uh, fundamentals of the Bible and Christianity. Now, if you, don't, if you come across somebody who doesn't, don't be afraid. We've got a lure in our tackle box. And we're going to make sure you get that lure. So we got lures for everybody. But let's just suppose Alan is the typical person you know. You know, the typical person, the member of the Church of Christ works with and knows, is normally kind of like them. The people we like to hang around, they kind of believe like us. They may not be Christians, but they got similar values. So these are questions that are not very difficult to, 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 to ask. And I'd say, Alan, um, by the way, um, do you believe the, in the Bible as the Word of God? Alan, do you believe the Bible has uh, got a bunch of mistakes in it? Okay. And, and Alan, do you believe that God will do everything he has said in the Bible? I do too. And Alan, are you saved? I want you to think back to the time when you were saved, Alan. And I want you to, just, I'm going to give you a minute. I want you to think about the, the time that you were, uh, you came to know Jesus Christ. You were saved. Uh, and uh, picture it in your mind. Uh, picture the day it happened. Uh, I want you to picture what you were wearing. I want you to picture uh, who was with you. And Alan, as you picture that, tell me what happened when you were saved. Describe your salvation experience. No, you were not baptized. You're, you're a sinner, Alan. You're okay. Preachers, preachers never get this right. They, they never get this right. It's hard for them to say it otherwise. All right, let's just start over. Alan, okay. All right. Now, so you came on. You came on. Tell me about the revival. You were at a revival. You were at a revival. And the preacher was raising his hand. And he came. You can't tell me about what happened when he got there. There you go. I knew, I knew you did. It was an experience. And, uh, and you said, pray, pray, you pray Jesus. You, uh, I know, praise Jesus. So he did everything. He did everything that, uh, and so we're going to get this written down. I'm going to write this down. I'm going to say, now, Alan, did I write that? Up? Is this right? Did this represent what you did? Brethren, I want to put a padlock on it. I'm not going to let him out of it. Once he tells me what he did to be saved, that's it. So I'm going to put a padlock on that. And I'm going to have it written down. And I'm going to pray God that I never have to bring it out of my pocket again. Because if I've got to bring it out of my pocket, that means Alan's having a problem being honest. So I'm going to help keep an honest man honest. Now, if he's a dishonest man, it doesn't matter if the Lord himself is doing the Bible study. He's not going to obey. But now there are others out there that maybe just need a little help. That's why you ask this question. Hey, Alan, by the way, um, if you've been baptized and you said you have been, will you say before the baptism or after the baptism? Oh, yes, of course, of course. And, um, and so how, how, how much longer after the, bapti the salvation were you baptized? Okay, very good. Creek baptism. So you had the running water too, didn't you? Got to be running water. All right. So we, we took care of all that. So now, now we've gotten all this written down. Now I've got the padlock on it. Now I did this very conversationally. All right. So I, I'm not going to give him a test. And now, now this is important because I need to know where he's at spiritually. And this helps me have a starting point. Now, once we establish that, we're just going to run right into back to the Bible. Now, let's look at, uh, let's look at these little booklets. Would you turn your Bible to John 8, 32? And here's what we're going to do. Um, I want to read the first one. And I want you to listen. And you can follow along in your Bible. And uh, here's what John said. John said, uh, Jesus said, and ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Alan, Jesus says the blank will make you free. What, what makes you free? I've, you know, I don't know if anyone has ever gotten that wrong. I mean, it comes right out of the text. You can't miss it. That's back to the Bible. Watch out. Now, Alan, this next one, I'm going to have you read it. So Alan's going to turn his Bible. And just as a practice, I never find the book of the Bible before the center. I never do. For some reason, I just can never beat them. So I'm, I'm always going to be flipping my Bible until they find it. And I might help them a little bit. And to get there, I want them to learn the books of the Bible. Alan, would you read me John 4, 24? 
uh, Alan, Jesus tells us we must worship God in spirit and in. Now, brethren, can you do that tonight? Can everybody do that? Because it's not that hard. We're talking about a Bible study. You don't have to invent. That's what back to the Bibles. I, I was talking to a missionary today in Guam. He'd, he'd, uh, uh, his name's Joey Tree. Man, Joey's an incredible, incredible uh, soul winner. And uh, he, he attended several of our seminars here stateside recently. Went back home. He's been training the congregation there at Guam. He, he sent me a statement that one of the members made. One of the members came up to Joey and they said, this is the simplest tool I have ever seen. Where has it been? That's what we want. We don't want to complicate matters. We do not want to make it difficult for people. We want to make this where just a common, everybody can do it from fifth grade on up. And so lesson one, book one is about Bible authority, Jesus, the name of Christ. Now we're not going to go through all this, but turn to page 66 in your Evangelism Simplified Guidebook. I want you to look at this. On page 66, we got a chart. It's called the Map of Revelation. That's not the book of Revelation. It's the map. It's how did God reveal himself to me. And so you're going to notice on that particular um, chart that it says all the truth starts with God the Father. All of it. That's back to the Bible. That's the first page of back to the Bible. Then you're going to notice that God, the Father, gives all the truth to God, the Son. That's page two and three of back to the Bible. So that chart is an illustration of book one. I like illustrations. So I'll, I'll photocopy that, and you have my permission to photocopy it. Put it on the table, and just, just, just use an illustration. Use a visual, and let them see how the, the teachings of back to the Bible Look when you write them out. So all the truth starts with God, then it goes to the Son, then it goes to the Holy Spirit who gave it to the apostles. Guess what the apostles did? They wrote it down in the Bible. By the way, we're under the New Testament, not the Old. That's, that's book one. It's fundamental. You can't do a lot without book one. Don't skip it. If you don't establish a firm foundation, a Bible authority, nothing else is going to work. So once you establish this, you can move on to book number two. Well, let's go ahead and book number two. Everybody go to book two. See how simple this is? You thought I was going to keep you here all night, didn't you? All right, look at book two. This is real easy. Uh, Alan, would you read Matthew 16 and 18 for me? So we're going to turn. Now, let me give you a few pointers. Now, when people are trying to find books of the Bible, let me give you just a couple suggestions. Don't tell them what page number. Don't give them a Bible with all marked up. And don't, do, don't say, well, uh, let me do it for you. Now, there's a reason I'm making this suggestion. Brethren, I want them to learn the books of the Bible. You know how long it takes to learn the Bible? Not long. If you can just get them to the first book and say, turn to the right a little bit. And just keep saying, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Here you go. You're at Romans. You're right there. Now, you, just, you know what that does? It builds confidence. When a person realizes that they can find books of the Bible, guess what? It, it helps them understand, I can do this. I don't need a preacher to spoon feed me. I don't need somebody to tell me. I can actually read it and I can see what I need to do. And so one of the unique things about being a child of God in the church of Christ is that we don't have to tell them what to believe. We just have to show them because everything we believe is in this book. I don't know how many converts have told us that one of the key moments to them was that you never told us what to do. I just, we just baptized a Mormon and a Baptist not long ago, just a few months ago. And, and um, they wrote me this text after the conversion. They said, Rob, we visited different churches. They said the difference between you guys and the Mormons and the Baptists is that they always told us what to do. You never told us what to do. That's not my job. My job is that the Lord do the telling. That's show don't tell, right? Get them to the book. Brethren, you don't have to tell them because God's already done it for you. That's the power. And so you don't need to say, well, you know, you need to do this. Please don't do that. Then it becomes about you. This is all about them and God. The further you remove yourself from the Bible study, the better you're, out, the better you're going to be. So let them, let them focus on what God says. So, uh, by the way, Alan, what does Jesus say in Matthew 16, 18? All right, uh, Alan, who built the church? And uh, to whom does the church belong? Well, if he built it, it belongs to him, right? So did Jesus build churches in the plural or church in the singular? 
That's one. His church. He just built his church. So it's not, again, not hard, not very complicated. So we want to keep it simple. God's not the author of confusion, but of peace in all the churches of the saints. Keep it simple. So we're going to go through book two just like we did book one. Now, book two can get a little bit um, um, uncomfortable for the teacher. Because you're going to notice in book number two, there are going to be some questions that are asked from some of these verses that are going to contradict their belief system. Like, uh, when are we supposed to take the Lord's Supper according to Acts 20, verse 7? First day of the week. Guess what they're not doing? Taking the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. Preacher, what do you do? When, what, what happens when you get to... Well, let me share with you. Let me just take you to Acts 27. Go to page 5, Alan. Let's look at it. So I'm going to walk you through one of these possibly uncomfortable moments. It's real simple, though, because Back to the Bible was written to deal with it. Alan, would you read me Acts 20? Now, in fact, I'm going to do something a little bit different, Alan. I want to read Acts 27, and I need your help. For some reason, I have a hard time reading Acts 20, verse 7 correctly, and I need you to make sure I read it correctly. Now, no, listen very carefully. Upon the First Sunday of the month, the disciples came together to break bread. Is that what it says? Okay, now stop me if I get it wrong. Upon the second and fourth Sundays of the month, the disciples, no. On Saturday, the disciples came together, no. On Easter, the disciples came together to break bread, no. On Christmas, the disciples came together to break bread, no. On quarterly, the disciples came together to break bread. I'm going to make sure I run through every scenario. And I'm going to make me, I'm going to make him tell me, no, that's not what it says. I do that in every Bible study. Alan, um, upon the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. Is that right? Uh, when God's told the Israelites in the Old Testament that they were to remember the Sabbath day in the Ten Commandments, did he mean for them to keep every Sabbath? And uh, just, I'm just going to throw this out. You don't have to do this. If you don't feel comfortable doing this, you don't have to. But let me, let, me, uh, let me take it to another step. What do you think would happen to an Israelite? I don't know. Let's just suppose they, uh, they got up one morning and there was a big storm that had come through a northerner. You know, and they looked out and there were sticks all over their yard, Alan. And then they said, you know what? The Bible doesn't say you have to keep every Sabbath, so I'm going to pick up sticks this Sabbath. And they went out there to pick up the sticks. What do you think would be done with this man? I don't know. What do you think? Do you think they might take him out of the camp? You know what they did, don't you? They stoned him. That actually happened in the Old Testament. I can't tell you what was going on in the man's head, but I can tell you he got up one morning and he decided he wasn't going to observe a Sabbath. And I just, I don't know, human nature to me would say to Moses, now Moses, it doesn't say every Sabbath. Didn't work very well, did it? Let's go to the next question. When those Christians met upon the first day of the week to eat the Lord's Supper, did they do it on the first day of each week? That's what they did. Should Christians today eat the Lord's Supper upon the first day of the week? Uh, it's it's kind of hard to avoid it. But, but, but Rob, yes, Alan. Um, Rob, I, my church doesn't do it that way. It doesn't. Well, how does your church do it, Alan? Special occasions. Alan, would you, uh, I want you to hold that thought for me. Would you hold that thought for me? Special occasions. Let's go to the next question. Page number five. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Special occasions. Um, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given an order to the church of the Galatia, even so do ye upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together um, um, to lay by in stores, God has prospered that there be no gatherings when I come. Now, Alan, is it God's will that we give as we've been prospered? Alan, does the church you attend give? Do they give every Sunday? Preacher. And if you were to go up to your preacher and say, Preacher, why am I giving every Sunday? What, what, do you think he might quote you this verse? The same language that's used in Acts 20, verse 7, for the Lord's Supper is used for the giving. Alan, I don't understand why it is that there are churches out here that um, they don't seem to ever get confused about the giving. When it comes to taking your money, they always get it right. Let me be very clear. When it comes to taking your money, they're never going to say just on the first and third Sunday of the month. When it comes to taking your money, it's just not on special occasions. They will take it every first day of the week. They're never going to miss. They will use 1 Corinthians 16 as their authority. I want to know why it is that churches get the, the money right, but they don't get the Lord's Supper right. Maybe because the money's more important. 
Maybe because we have people out here that are more concerned about the material things than they are the spiritual things. You know, I've never had that question answered in a study, not one time. At most, the person will say, I'm going to go ask my pastor about that. I said, I, I can't wait to hear his answer. Let's go to book number three. In book number three, we're going to deal with the most important question in life. What must you do to be saved? And uh, at this point, even though Alan realizes, and it's been an eye-opening experience for Alan... Alan's realized that although he did not even know what testament he was living under, although Alan did not realize he was not under the Old Testament, although Alan did not even understand that Jesus is the head of one church and you're supposed to worship on the first day of the week, take the Lord's Supper, we've gone through all that. Although Alan cannot find the name of his church in the Bible, but he can find the church of Christ, although all those facts have been laid out succinctly, guess what? Alan still thinks he's saved. So you know what my job is in the third study? My job is to make sure that Alan knows he's lost. That's my job. But I can't tell you. Because that is not my job to tell you. Because there is one judge, and his name is Jesus Christ, and he will be the judge of all mankind. And I'm not going to pass judgment on Alan Judd. That's not what I'm there to do. What I'm there to do, though, is to, to help Alan see it for himself. I want him to read the words of the judge. I want him to come to a conclusion I'm going to help him get there, but I'm not going to tell him. Now, Alan, you realize you're going to hell. That is not your job. If you do that, the Bible study is over. You've superseded your authority. You're there to lead him to the cross. And when a person gets to the cross, they're going to see it. They still think they're saved. We don't baptize saved people, so they must understand they're lost. You do that by beginning with sin. And you explain to them what sin does. For example, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, it separates us from God. So we're going to go through the process of sin. Now, if you're dealing with somebody that's living in sin, that's got a sin problem, guess what you're going to do? It's at that, that point you're going to describe it. You're going to go over it. You're going to make sure that they have understanding of what the word adultery means. You're going to make sure they understand what the word fornication means. You're going to make sure they understand what the word uh, lasciviousness means. You're, that's your job. You're going to go through it and back to the Bible. They're going to understand what the word drunkenness means. So there may be some repentance that needs to be done. Now I'm going to abrogate. I'm going to, I'm going to give that point. I'm going to say that we've done this. I'm going to say that Alan's just a good old guy. He don't really have a lot of problems. He's got a sin problem, but he's not, he don't have a sin addiction. He, he, he don't, I don't need to sit down with Alan and say, now, Alan, you, you know, this, uh, this young lady you, you've been living with. I don't have to have that discussion. Now, I'll do that tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll deal with people who are a little bit different. They're, they're going to be a little bit more challenging. But tonight, Alan's just the average person out here. All right. So we're going to abrogate all of that. We're going to go through sin. We're going to help him understand that sin makes people lost. We're going to help him understand that he needs a savior. And we're going to take him through. Now look at that asterisk on page 10. Everybody go to page 10 and you're back to the Bible. Go to page 10. Everybody go to page number 10. Page number 10 is, is what we call the invitation song. On page number 10, this is where people make the response. Most people we study with are baptized on page 10. Why are they baptized on page 10? I'll show you. They're baptized on page 10 because of page number 9. So go to page number 9. I'm going to show you why people make that decision on page 10. So what we're going to do for the last, I don't know, 10 minutes of this lesson is we're going to, we're going to spend 10 minutes on explaining how to teach page 9. Because this, in my view, is the most powerful passage. This is the most powerful point you can make to bring a sinner to the cross. So we're going to go ahead and look at Romans 6, 3 through 5. So everybody take your Bibles, get a pen, because we're going to mark. We're going to make some notes tonight. So Romans 6, 3 through 5. And let's go ahead and look at this chart, page 92. You've got, a, you've got a copy of it in your foyer. I loved it. I saw it out there. This is called the gospel enacted, the gospel reenacted. So we're going to look at the gospel. And I'm going to make sure they understand the importance of Jesus dying on the cross and being buried and rising again the third day. I'm going to make sure they understand that. We're going to focus on it. I might even read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. You don't have to, but I might read it. Now, with that being said, laying that chart right out in front of them, we're going to go to Romans chapter 6. And I'm going to say, Alan, 
we're going to read Romans 6 together, and I'm going to make a few points, and I want you to look at them with me. Verse number 3, everybody with me? This is important. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into... Now, I want you to take your pen or pencil and circle the word into. Just circle that word. It's real simple. Baptized into Jesus Christ. We're baptized into. Take your pen and circle the word into. That's your second time. So twice, God has told you that baptism is a transitionary process. It takes you from the outside to the inside. Those are called prepositions. They locate you. They tell you where you're positioned, where you're located. I've got news for you tonight. There isn't a person in this church building tonight that did not come into the church building. It's impossible. I'm going to ask a question to the audience. Is there anybody in this auditorium that physically could be in this building if they did not come into the building. You know, there's always one in the crowd. And he was a physicist. And he raised his hand. He said, preacher, he said, it is possible if the building was built around you. There's always one. All right. No, the building was not built around you. The church was not built around you. So the only way to get in the church is to come into the church. All right, you got to come into. Now, let's keep going. Verse 3. We're baptized into his death. Now, you want to do this. I know some of you, it frightens you to write in your Bible because mama said don't write in the Bible. Listen, tonight I'm, I'm asking you, write in your Bible. Put a number one right by the word death. You don't want to miss this. This is important. So put a number one right by the word death. Now watch this, verse number four. Therefore, we are buried. Put a number two right by the word buried. With him by baptism, notice this, into. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into. That's the third time. Three times God has told you that baptism is a transitionary process. You can't miss it. It, it bites you. You can't miss it. Three times he said that. Verse number four. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death like as Christ was raised. Would you put a number three right by the word raised? Can you do that for me? Put a, put a number three right by the word raised. What have you just highlighted? You've highlighted the death, the burial, and the resurrection. What do we call that, everybody? That is the gospel. That's the facts of the gospel. Without that, we are wasting time tonight. So you just covered the facts of the gospel. Death, burial, and resurrection. Now, keep going with me. Never stop right there. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised. From the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness. You've got to go through something like the death of Christ. You've got to go through something like the death of Christ. We should be planted in the likeness of his resurrection. You've got to go through something like the death, the burial, and the resurrection. You can't go to heaven without it. Guess what that is? Try to explain this away. Try to figure a way around this. In order to go to heaven, you've got to experience the death, the burial, and the resurrection. The likeness of it. Aren't you glad you don't literally have to go to the cross? That someone else did that for you? Aren't you glad you don't literally have to, to go through the pain and agony of the cross? Because someone did it for you. But you've got to go through the likeness of it. Now, with that being said, it becomes very simple. Alan, does the Bible describe the one baptism as a burial in water? It does. Where do we get the benefits of the death of Jesus? Being buried with him in baptism. That's right. That's how you get the benefits. Uh, uh, Alan, if you are baptized the way the Bible says, could you be wrong? No. All right. The Bible's right. And, and, and Alan, if you are not baptized the way the Bible says, could you be wrong? Yes. I, you know what he just did? He locked himself in. There is no way out. He does not realize what he just did. He just admitted that if he was not baptized the way the Bible says, he could be wrong. Guess what? He has not been baptized the way the Bible says. He has just now admitted that if you are not baptized the way the Bible says, could you be wrong? He said, yes, and I know he's wrong. Because when I asked those questions at the beginning of that study, he told me he was baptized months after his salvation. He was not baptized, was he? He just got wet. He doesn't know this, but my job is going to be to help him realize that. Now, in order to help him realize this, there are a couple things I can do. The best thing to do is stick with the book. If you're not comfortable, stick with the book. 
because that book is going to, and it's going to be the ace in your hole. That's going to be the ace in your deck, excuse me. So, so as you get more comfortable, sometimes you like to use illustrations. I'm going to use an illustration. Hey, Alan, um, you got a dog at home. Yes. Yes. And, uh, and let's just suppose, uh, let's just suppose you and Amy um, have this dog at home. And I don't know, maybe the name of the dog is Poopsie. And you got a poops, Alan's got a poopsie. And, uh, and let's say you just bought the dog because you want to, you know, the kids to have a dog. And, and you got the dog and uh, Alan has a problem with poopsie. Poopsie doodles on the carpet constantly. Poopsie is a doodling dog. And the dog does not seem to understand it needs to go outside to do its doodles. So it doodles inside. And Alan is very patient. I can tell that he's a very patient preacher. And uh, he has been trying to train the Poopsie. He keeps trying to tell Poopsie, now Poopsie, go outside. He's done all the disciplinary actions. Amy's been working with the Poopsie. Alan is getting fed up with the Poopsie. He's tired of fixing the doodles. And, uh, and finally, one day, Sunday morning, he gets up and he says to Amy and uh, to the kids, he says, listen, if we get back home and that dog has done a doodling again in our carpet, it's done. I'm done cleaning the doodles. Every man has an end to his patience. So Alan goes to the church services. He goes through the service. He comes back home. He opens the door. There's little poops. He just a whip. And there are the doodles. Alan says, no more. I said, it's all done. He takes the poopsie by the collar, goes out there and grabs the shovel, goes outside to the, to the, the yard, and he begins to dig. He ties the, doodle, the poopsie to the tree, and the neighbors begin to come as he is a ranting and a raving about the doodles. And he begins to shovel and shovel and says, I'm, I'm done with the doodles. And he takes the poopsie, as, and he puts the poopsie in the hole. He covers up the hole. What do you think the neighbors are going to do with Alan? Any, any guess? They are going to call the police because you have a madman who's burying a living thing. Brethren, we don't bury living things, do we? Except in religion. Only in religion. We bury... See, what the denominational world does is they take someone who's been born again. They take someone who has experienced a new birth. They have, they, have, uh, they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They've been forgiven of their sins. They've been saved. They're a babe in Christ. And they take that brand new babe in Christ. And guess what they want to do with that babe in Christ? They want to bury the baby. You did that to the dog. We take you to jail. Why are we letting these preachers get away with that? Why are we letting these pastors out there and these reverends tell people that have supposedly become Christians, they're babes in Christ, you, you need to go get buried. You don't bury living things, you bury dead things, things that have sin. That's why Jesus Christ takes sinners and he buries them. He doesn't take living things and bury them. Did everybody just understand that illustration? It's hard to miss. But if you don't want to use the illustration, it's all right. So just use back to the Bible. Alan, do you want to take a chance on missing heaven? All right. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Very good. Alan, as we have seen Jesus commands repentance, are you willing to start making the changes in your life that Jesus commands and live for God? Are you willing to do that? Good. Uh, Alan, have you uh, been baptized into the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins? Say yes. Okay. I'm going to let him get away with it. You know why? I'm not going to keep him. I'm going to let him get away with it. I know he's not. He doesn't, he still doesn't get it. So I'm going to let him fall right into it. He'll get it. He'll get it. Alan, um, let's suppose that you were taught that your sins were forgiven before the baptism. Is it possible to go get baptized to have your sins forgiven if you thought your sins were forgiven before the baptism? Does that make any sense? Let me, let me ask it like this. If you were taught you were saved before baptism... Now, I don't want you to answer. I just want you to think about what I'm going to say. If someone out there said, Alan, you were saved, you accepted Jesus Christ in your heart, and uh, you said the, the sinner's prayer, and you've been saved. If you were taught you were saved before the baptism, could you then go get baptized to be saved? If someone did not teach you that baptism was to be saved, can you be baptized to be saved? If you were not taught the right thing about baptism, can you be baptized the right way? If you weren't taught the truth, can you obey the truth? Dear friends, obedience is not an accident. You cannot be accidentally baptized. You must know what you're doing. By the way, did anybody ever explain to you why you were being baptized? Did you understand what we just read in the Bible about baptism when you got wet? 
And if you didn't understand what you were doing, I wonder how you were baptized. I know how we can fix this, Alan. Let's just do one more question together. Alan, the Bible says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Alan, if we really love Jesus, we, we want to obey him. And Alan, do you love him? Alan, do you want to obey him? And Alan, since Jesus wants you to be baptized, and now that you understand the importance of being baptized right now, wouldn't it please Jesus for you to be baptized right now? The water's raiding tonight. Maybe there's someone in our audience tonight who did not understand what they did when they were baptized. Maybe you were taught that you were saved before you were baptized. I have news for you tonight. It doesn't give me any pleasure to tell you this. You cannot be taught the wrong thing and obey the right thing. Because baptism is not an accident. You must understand what you did. And if tonight you did not understand that, why not fix it? Why not come as we prepare to sing this song of invitation? And say, listen, I want to be baptized because I know the truth. And I want to obey the truth. You can't be taught error and obey the truth. Doesn't make any sense, does it? This is so simple. Anybody can do it. And so tonight, if you're in that condition, the baptistry is ready. All you got to do is walk forward. We'll take your confession. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. If you've never done that before, why would you not now tonight... Would you be buried with your Lord in baptism? Would you not be resurrected with your Lord? Come out of the watery grave. Would you not understand that now that you have been baptized, you have been cleansed from your sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. You're now a member of his church. And if that tonight is your desire, will you not come as together we stand and as we sing?